Good day to all Ghost Adventures fans, this coming New Year Ghost Adventures will having a very special investigation at the Comedy Store Los Angeles. Zach Baggins wrote on his official Facebook page about this surprising announcement. Surprise announcement time. On New Year's Day we'll premiere a very special Ghost Adventures investigation at the world-famous Comedy Store. This mysterious building has a very dark past from its days associated with the mob and is notoriously known as an iconic Hollywood haunt. We will be having some surprise famous comedians as special guests who have had terrifying experiences inside this building. January 1st 10 9th C on Travel Channel. Says Zach Baggins. Stay tuned and mark your calendar now so you won't miss this New Year's very special episode of Ghost Adventures. If you haven't subscribed yet, like and share, please do so for more new videos. This is comedian Jeff Ross unexpectedly sharing an emotional ghost story while in the middle of roasting me, watch it all go down this Friday. Said Zach Baggins. I've only been ghosted one time, it wasn't here. My experience happened just a few blocks from here. I was working here every night, having the best time of my life. I lived on Doheny, not too far from here. I had a job on the Man Show as a writer for Comedy Central, and I was like, just got my first Porsche. I was living this hotshot Hollywood life, just some punk from Newark, New Jersey. Like, I couldn't believe my shit was working. And I was in the West Coast, and I was staying on Adina Menzel's couch for a month, because I didn't have my own apartment, and I looked for apartments. And they showed me this one apartment, ninth, ninth floor, and I loved it. Beautiful view of Hollywood, right? And then I said, I'll take it. And the lady, Sylvia, she was the, the agent, she says, I have to disclose that the previous tenant killed himself. Huh. And I felt this weird energy, it just sort of shiver. And I said, thank you very much, and I didn't rent it. A couple days later, I'm at Adina's couch, my back hurts, I really need to find an apartment. Sylvia calls me, she says, same floor, different apartment. I go over with my manager, rent it on the spot. I'm having so much fun, beautiful balcony. I smoke cigars every night on the balcony, write jokes for, for my writing jobs on TV, like chicks, parties. It was like, wow, I can't believe like, I'm that Hollywood douchebag that I used to make fun of back in New York. Right that I used to make fun of in the Woody Allen movies. Now suddenly I'm living that life and I'm like, this is so much fun. And my neighbor, finally, some, that apartment's empty forever. Finally somebody rents it. And this guy, you know, he's, I meet him in the elevator. He's a waiter, he's an actor. His name's Rob. I said, you know, this person, they told you, right? You rented that apartment. He's like, yeah, they gave me a good break on rent. Nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. Now, a year goes by, and the only time I'd ever see Rob, he'd just be in his apartment, always by himself. I'd always have friends over, he'd always be by himself. He had this lonely life. And once in a while, he would just be dancing around naked, and we'd, whatever, or another time, he'd just be eating by himself, and I'd catch his eye from across the courtyard. And we'd give a little wink, we were both sort of like starting out in show business, but my thing was working, and he was struggling. I go off on this road trip, I do a gig, I come back two weeks later, the building's all different. There's nobody playing tennis, nobody at the pool. It's a weird vibe, you know, you just like an energy of like, is it a holiday? I don't realize. What's going on? Where is everybody? I go down, I talk to the door guy, the security guy. I said, what's going on? And he's like, you didn't hear? I go, what? He goes, your neighbor. I go, my neighbor? Rob, the actor guy. I go, what happened? He jumped just like the guy did the previous tenant. I go, what? Eight in the morning, everybody in the building could see it. There's a spot. You know, I got chills. And I realized no one's using their balcony. My balcony, I shut it down. It was too weird. Two people from the same apartment. It's just like, wow, Hollywood's tough. Suddenly stuff starts happening in my apartment. Weird shit starts happening. I'm laying in bed and I start hearing Ooh, like weird fucking noises. I'm not even a believer. Uh, I'm a cynical guy and I'm just Ooh, and I go, uh, oh my God, I must have wake up. I must have left the balcony open. You know, and I realize no, I haven't opened that fucking balcony in days. And I'm too creeped out. There's no one out there. This noise keeps happening. Ooh, it gets louder and louder where I feel something. 
And I make it through the night, and I'm telling my buddies at work, and they're laughing at me. I'm at the man show. They're all like, you're fucking crazy, whatever. They thought it was a big joke. But this keeps happening. Every night, weird shit's happening. And I'm feeling a presence of someone in my area. It all culminated on this night where a picture, you know, little stuff is happening on the balcony. Little dust bunnies are coming up nine stories and just dropping shit on my balcony. It's like angry. And all of a sudden, one night, I have a big picture that I got bought in Hawaii, John Lennon painted of himself as a Statue of Liberty, and it's bang! It's lifting up off the wall by itself. And I'm like shivering, shivering. And I was already telling people I think something's weird in my apartment. I'm already like, I think I need to find another apartment. And I wouldn't talk about it in the apartment. I respected this, what I felt was a tortured soul. Yeah. And I, I, I summoned the courage to go look at this painting. And I, boom, boom, it's hitting it harder. It's not breaking it. It's dropping it just like somebody who could tell that the, the glass would break if they dropped it. And there's, no, there's nothing that would explain what's happening and why I'm feeling this. And I'm too scared to even call someone because my phone's in the other room and I don't want to walk past it. So I go back in my bed. I, like, huddle down. I'm a grown person. I have a black belt in Taekwondo. Like, I'm not a sissy. I'm not going to be afraid. I felt like this was something I couldn't handle. And I laid there for a while. And finally, I just couldn't take the noise. And I had to see what was happening. And I summoned the courage somehow. And I walked past it all. And I swung the balcony open. And I stood out there. And I spoke to him. I said, I'm sorry that I wasn't here. I'm sorry that this is such a hard life and I'll never forget you. And I thanked him for reminding me that I have it good. And in so many ways, I think he saved me. At least that's how I interpret it. I know there's a million ways to interpret this stuff, but I actually lit up a cigar and I lit up another one for him and I threw it into the wind and I just sort of toasted him and acknowledged him and respected this tortured soul and I said, there's nothing here for you. I'm sorry, you have to leave me alone. You're scaring the fuck out of me. And he did. So to Rob. Today I will give you sneak peek about the comedy store and what happened to a former showgirl relives her botched abortion and a mob boss. The comedy store, located in West Hollywood, where many comics got their start and are still performing to this day. Many comedians got their start here, and this venue has remained very popular indeed. From Richard Pryor to Robin Williams to Ali Wong have taken the stage, but the comedians aren't the only ones putting on a show. History. The Sunset Strip area was not under the jurisdiction of the city of Los Angeles from its beginning in 1870, until the year, 1984. This led to this area of West Hollywood to being open for legal activity, that drew people who were interested in not only legal stage entertainment but in the not-so-legal area of sensual entertainment, games of chance, and of course the banned alcoholic drinks during Prohibition. During this time, the Mafia of course, had its fingers in this club. As William Wilkerson the owner of the comedy store had several clubs on the Sunset Strip, he probably worked out business deals with Mickey Cohen the notorious American mobster and the underworld boss who controlled the vice businesses on the Sunset Strip. The time of the 1920s, 1940s, 1950s, mobster Mickey Cohen ran a brothel right next to Ciro's. Beside demanding a cut of the club's profits which was a cost owners paid to stay in business and breathing as well. Mickey set up his headquarters in an office located upstairs in the Ciro's building. When you walk from the main room up to the sound booth, behind the staircase is said to be Mickey's old office. Notice the hole cut into the wall. It's believed that when you upset the boss you were told to go up to his office and see him. As you walked up to the stairs a gun would be placed through the hole and you would be shot in the back of the head. Official mob unpleasant business was taken care of downstairs in the basement. There was a killing and torture room to hurt, punish and kill problem people. Customers who couldn't pay their gaming debts, romanced the wrong waitress or showgirl, or were guilty of some other offense were the ones who suffered and died here. In the basement, there also was an abortion clinic set up for showgirls, prostitutes and girlfriends of mobsters to get rid of their tummy bumps. These women probably didn't have a choice in this matter. A nurse of questionable skill who was on Mickey's payroll, performed illegal abortions. One woman died from her abortion, and the nurse was, publicly humiliated, and probably killed by the dead woman's boyfriend. 
During the 60s, the venue of the club changed to providing rock and roll stage acts, up until the mid-1970s, when new business people moved in to try something new. Sammy and Mitzi Shore started out their comedy club venture by renting a room in the building, where they opened up a unique venue that featured male comedians, on April 10, 1972. Their success let them move to a bigger space. When the original Ciro's building, where Sammy and Mitzi had rented a room at the beginning of the comedy store venture, was put on the real estate market, Mitzi bought it. She enlarged the main stage of this original Ciro's building, to hold a much bigger audience. The most popular young comics would perform here, as well as more established, seasoned comics. On another stage in the Ciro's comedy store, Mitzi gave women comics their own stage, and called it the Belly Room. The Belly Room is where multiple witnesses have spotted the ghost of famed comedian Sam Kinison. Kinison is one of several spirits rumored to be haunting the comedy store. One comedian, Steve Lubitkin, who was a close friend of Mitzi's, was heavily involved in the strike. Afterwards, he wasn't allowed to perform at the comedy club, which crushed his hopes at a comeback. This pushed him over the edge, and he jumped from the 14th floor of the Continental Hyatt House that was right next door to the comedy club. He was aiming for the roof of the comedy club but landed in the driveway instead. His suicide note stated, My name is Steve Lubitkin. I used to work at the comedy store. In his note, he blamed Mitzi for not letting him perform there. Throughout the years at the comedy store, Audiences have been entertained by stand-up comedy from such funny people and got their start at the comedy store were Louis Anderson, Jim Carrey and Chris Rock. The comedy store still offers the top up-and-coming talent, as well as more established comics. Welcome. We are in the